Okay, here we are again for part two of uh, this other lecture, lecture number eight um, of ENGR 2302 Engineering Dynamics. So let's continue right where we left off on part one. I know this is a very theory heavy lecture, but unfortunately that's just where we are today. So. All right, so I want to look about look at angular momentum of the system of particles about the mass center. That's what I'm going to look at next. So angular momentum about the mass center. Uh, about the mass center. About the mass center. angular momentum about the mass center. Okay, um, so uh, something like this. Um, so how to describe this? I'll do it like this. Uh, consider the centroidal frame. A centroidal frame of reference that means with respect to the centroid of the system of particles. The centroidal frame of reference, uh, frame of reference, uh, g x prime y prime z prime. Which translates with which translates with respect to uh, the Newtonian frame, or the general frame, frame or the global frame. Uh, Newtonian frame uh, O X Y Z. So you're going to have something like this. So let me draw the uh, Newtonian frame first. And in general, the uh, centroidal frame is not a Newtonian frame. O, X, Y, Z, and then a local centroidal frame here, that maybe I'll draw in purple or something. <coughs> so a frame generated about the um, the frame of reference here, or it's about the centroid here, <coughs> about uh, sorry, a frame of reference about the uh, centroid of the system particles G, or the centroid of, center of mass. Now the x, y, and z are in the pointing the same direction, but X, Y, Z, etc. X prime, Y prime, Z prime, etc. And there would be an R prime for an for an individual particle. Then consider an individual particle, pi. An individual particle, pi. There would be a position vector with respect to the centroidal frame, R prime i. Uh, R prime I or R I prime, and there would be then a um, velocity or a momentum vector M M I V prime I M I V I prime. So there'll be a velocity uh, with respect. Basically, this velocity is the velocity of the particle with respect to the center of mass of the system of particles. So if I were then to look at this, I could say I would want to maybe find the, if I want to look at the angular momentum about the centroid, the angular momentum the 
the angular momentum of the system of particles about of the system of particles uh, about the mass center Well, I would say that H, uh, that H um, prime G is going to be equal to the summation of, um, from I equals 1 to N, of the individual angular momentum of each of the particles, of Ri prime, Ri prime vector, crossed into mi vi prime vector. And then I'll work through some math related to this on the next page. So again, we have a local coordinate system about the um, passing through the, uh, center of the, the center of mass here, or the mass center. And um, I want to look at the angular momentum of the swarm of particles, or the system of particles, about its own center of mass. So. Uh, then if I did a uh, time derivative on this, if I took the derivative of this with respect to time, I could get the h dot, the rate of change in angular momentum, about the, so the rate of change of angular momentum of the system of particles about its own center of mass, or about its own mass center, h prime g, isn't this lovely, is equal to the summation of, um, just like we looked at last time, the rate of change here, uh, I equals 1 to n of r prime i crossed into mi ai uh, prime, which is equal to the summation uh, from, so that's a prime here, summation i equals 1 to n of Ri prime crossed into uh, Mi uh, cross uh, then uh, times uh, A uh, the individual Ais minus the Ag. So in other words, the uh, acceleration vector in the local frame of reference is going to be the difference between the um, acceleration vector in the global frame of reference minus the acceleration vector of the system of particles as a whole. This is a g here. So I'm replacing ai prime with ai minus ag. Then this is equal to the summation from i equals 1 to n of ri prime uh, crossed into mi ai prime uh, minus, let me, if I bring this out here, and let me see here, that should be a closed parenthesis here if I'm going to be mathematically correct, minus the summation of uh, here, maybe parentheses here, i equals 1 to n of mi r, uh, basically mi r prime, crossed in to ag cross into AG, which is then equal to the summation uh, from I equals 1 to N of Ri prime, uh, Ri prime vector, the position vector of the, uh, of the particle, the summation of each individual. Basically, this is the summation of the, um, of the angular momentums here, uh, crossed into mi ai is then equal to the um, ri, the summation from i equals 1 to n of ri prime crossed in to um, fi, the individual forces, um, which is then equal to simply capital M G.
So then if I want to interpret this, I can say, um, it, all of this in English, is the moment resultant about G, or the resultant moment, about G, um, of the external forces, is equal to um, the rate of change uh, the rate of change um, of the angular momentum of the system of particles of the angular momentum of the system of particles about G. And that makes sense. If I look at where I start and where I end, in other words, H dot G prime is equal, simply equal to um, the summation of, well, actually I should have a summation here, the summation of um, mg. The summation that of the, the moments on uh, applied, basically the forces on each individual particle transformed into moments about the center of mass of the system. The mass center of the system here. All right, so hopefully fairly straightforward. I know this is all Greeks in some cases, but we will eventually see some um, practical applications of this to a certain degree. Um, so if I also want to look at, what if I want to look at um, about, what if I want to see, say, the angular momentum, what if I want to consider the <coughs> angular momentum about G um, of particles in their absolute motion or absolute reference frame in their absolute motion uh, relative to the Newtonian what if I wanted to look at that to their Newtonian Uh, o, X, Y, Z frame of reference. What if I considered that? So now I want to look maybe at the um, individuals, well, or in the global frame. So, um, let's see. So again, that would be um, if I were to Look at that, it would be HG is equal to the summation of um, I equals 1 to N. Same idea, but in the global frame of reference. RI prime crossed into MI VI is equal to um, summation I equals 1 to N of Ri prime uh, crossed M times uh, Vg uh, plus Vi prime, or yeah, Vi prime. And I'll label what all these things are on a graphic in a second. Is equal to the summation of uh, I equals one to N. I equals one to N of mi uh, ri prime dotted in to vg the velocity of g in the global frame of reference plus the summation um, i equals 1 to n of ri prime cross mi vi here, 
or so I could simply say HG is equal to H prime G is equal to summation of moments G. In other words, the um, angular momentum should be equivalent. Uh, about G of particles is independent of reference frames. Is independent of the reference frame. Notice these are all equal. Independent of the reference frame. I can use the local frame or I can use the global frame, but it doesn't matter where I sum moments about, the angular momentum should be sa the same regardless. It's independent of the reference frame. Now, if you define a different um, location that you're looking at the uh, moment about, but um, independent of the reference frame, but if I transform things to look differently, then um, if, I, if I look at the moment vector about another point, then it should all be the same regardless of the reference frame, whether I'm considering the local or the global. Um, there. And what this is referencing to is um, something perhaps like this. If I were to draw a little graphic, I probably should have drawn this first, but oh well. So where this is x prime, or sorry, x y and z with our global origin here and then with g here x prime y prime and z prime oh and let's say we had a particle here Um, let's say we had a particle here, and let's say in a certain frame of reference, depending on the frame of reference, you could have two different velocities. Maybe you, if maybe in the in the global frame of reference, or sorry, the local frame of reference, you have m i v i prime, and then maybe in the global you had m i uh, v i, and then um, maybe v maybe the g would also have a certain velocity as well. So, I could say that velocity i would be equal to velocity g here, uh, velocity of the um, center of mass g plus vg prime. The velocity, would, so the, the global velocity of the particle is going to be equal to the velocity of the center of mass plus the um, velocity relative with respect to the center of mass. And the angular momentum about g, about g of the particles in their motion relative to um, g uh, relative to g x prime y prime z prime to g x prime y prime z prime uh, is h prime g is equal to the summation from i equals 1 to n of the cross product of r i crossed into m i can write it cross properly, cross uh, mi vi um, prime. That can manage to write an x properly. Okay. Then um, if I look at the so finally for finishing up theory, this is the last bit of theory for the day. I promise. Make sure I'm not lying. Yes, I promise. Um, this is the last bit of theory for the day. Um, if I want to look at the conservation of angular momentum, 
So next I'm gonna look at the conservation of angular momentum, then we're gonna finish up with an example or two applying some of this lovely nonsense. So I know this has been fairly dense, but um, hopefully uh, we can get through this. So finally looking at the conservation of angular momentum. Looking at the conservation of angular, I can't, I hate it when I can't really say dot. Uh, the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, first of all, if no external forces act on on the system, if no external forces act on the system, um. Then the linear momentum um, and angular momentum are fixed, are conserved. Then the linear momentum, linear and angular momentum, of the system are fixed. In other words, um, L dot. So our, our linear momentum equals the summation of forces. Uh, the summation of forces vector is simply zero. And so the linear momentum is constant. And uh, h prime o, or h, sorry, h dot o, is equal to the summation of m o, the moments about o, uh, which is equal to zero. And so HO is constant. The angular momentum of the system is constant if there are no external moments, and no net external moments. Um, now, in some problems, this is not the case. In some situations, this is not the case. In some situations, this is not the case. So you could have um, L dot, and I think after this, we're going back to my cat. Um, L dot is equal to the summation of forces, which is not equal to zero, and linear momentum is not constant. And uh, H dot O, H dot O is equal to summation of MO, summation of moments about the origin uh, is equal to, is um, say, in this case, might be equal to zero. So um, in some situations, this is not the case, um, such as problems involving central forces. That means uh, forces involved in going through the center, uh, involving central forces. So if I apply a force through the center um, of the uh, particles, I would still have a constant angular momentum, but my linear momentum would not be constant. So my angular, if, I'm, if I apply a force through the centroid of the system of particles, the linear momentum will change, but the angular momentum will not. So we'll look at some examples of this. I could also have a um, something else. If I look at the um, concept of conservation of momentum, the concept of conservation of momentum of momentum also applies, if I can manage to write a P properly, uh, to the al analysis of the mass to the analysis of the mass center motion. So I could look at the motion of the mass center.
motion of the mass center. So therefore, um, the rate of change of angular of sorry linear momentum is equal to the summation of forces is equal to zero. Oh, summation of nothing is equal to zero. Summation of forces is equal to zero. So L, which equals mvg, uh, is constant. This is if there are no external forces applied to the system of particles as a whole. So the velocity of the mass center is positive, is, is constant. And the angular momentum is also constant. Uh, VG, uh, HG is equal to the summation of MG, moments about G, which would also be equal to zero. And so HG is constant. HG would also be uh, constant as well. Okay, so let's discuss some conceptual uh, applications of this. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, go, I'm going to look at a few, um, a few instances of systems of particles, maybe planets and cats again, because um, planets and cats are fun. So let's look at planets and cats again. So uh, say here that uh, something like this. Um, consider something like my cat jumping. Say the cat, uh, the cat likes to climb up to high places. My cat, like many cats, likes to climb up to high places. Um, it's something they just are want to do. And because they're very poorly behaved, they can jump on tables and counters and things like that. Um, so let us say that the cat jumps from a high shelf down to the ground. So there's a shelf here, the ground here, well, not super high, maybe, you know, three or four feet, you know, not a, a 50 foot high shelf or something, but let us say the cat jumps from the shelf. I really cannot draw cats. I have my mutant demon cat here. Actually, I'm gonna draw the cat as elongated so I can better show the rotation of the cat. It'd be a little bit pudgier than my cat really is. So let's say the cat is jumping off the bookshelf. <laughs> okay, so, and the cat has a certain center of mass. Now, if the cat leaves the bookshelf horizontally, what will happen to the cat's motion? If it just walks, if it just runs off the bookshelf and just lets gravity take over, well, the cat's motion will, um, it will not experience any degree of rotation, will it not? It will not experience any degree of rotation. In other words, its net angle, the cat's net angular momentum cannot change. The cat's net angular momentum will not change. Its linear momentum can change because gravity is an external force, and it, the, it's, uh, when it's on the bookshelf, the external forces, the normal force and the gravitational force on the cat are balanced. But as, when it's falling, I should cats need t poofy tails too. This is important. This is physics. Um, so it will fall down with its initial velocity, but the um, so the translational velocity of its center of mass will not, so it's, ex, uh, let me sort of draw the, finish drawing the cat and then I'll um, focus on one thing at a time. This cat seems to be getting progressively fatter as it falls. But yes, that is the cat. So as it falls, it's gonna fall in a parabolic motion, assuming it, let's say it ran off the bookshelf for whatever reason, it didn't, now cats usually jump off bookshelves, but let's say it just ran horizontally for some reason. You know, it does seem to get more potato as it falls down, more crudely drawn. So its path would be a parabolic arc of some sort, right? Now, let us consider this. There would be a certain, um, now I'm, I, I'm drawing the system for a cent, the, the, the label for a centroid, but as we've seen, we could consider the cat as a summation of particles, individual atoms, that kind of thing. Well, um, here, this is what would happen. Well. The uh, rate of change, or the change in its angular momentum, uh, 
h dot about its own center of mass or even about any uh, other uh, location, any other coordinate system, would be equal to zero. It would have to undergo no net change in angular momentum. So it could have some angular momentum. For example, if it jumped, it might be spinning a bit and it would uh, spin as it fell. But once it was actually in the air, at that point, it can do nothing to change its angular momentum. If it, if it starts out rotating, it will just keep on rotating as it falls, won't it? it? It has nothing to push off against, so it will simply keep on rotating. However, its linear momentum, um, L dot, the L dot vector, or the rate of change in linear momentum, will not be equal to zero because it's under an external force. It will, it will be under an external force, and that would be gravity. And so it doesn't matter whether I'm looking at about a uh, center of mass or about the global position, it's going to be, it's, uh, it would not be uh, equal to zero. Okay, so then the question is, if I say this, the cat cannot rotate, uh, if it cannot change its net angular momentum, then I might ask the obvious question, how does a cat land on its feet? Hmm. How does a cat land on its feet? Hmm. Um, please don't do this. This is very mean to kitties, so please don't do this. Um, but at different times, cats fall. We've all seen cats jump or fall or whatever. They like to climb up in tall things, so that just is part of their um, life cycle or lifespan. So if you construct a rig where you drop a cat perfectly horizontally, well, uh, perfectly upside down, please don't do this. This is a bit mean to cats. If we drop our cat, our weird mutant, weird cat here, and I drop it, again, under gravity, Yeah, and apparently it's tailored skin here as it falls, or as it goes along. Somehow, it needs to rotate and end up back on its feet. How does this happen? I just told you that angular momentum has to be conserved. So how does that happen? It's a very triangular cat. And they're having an arch <laughs> cat. <laughs> I cannot draw felines. Oh my god, it's bad even for me. For a balloon animal cat, <laughs> morbidly obese cat here. <laughs> it's Garfield, yes. Looks like a turtle. Huh? It looks like it's screaming. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Um, okay, so I drop the cat perfectly horizontally on its back, and somehow it lands on its feet. How does this happen if angular, if it can't, once, it, once it's in the air, it can't change its angular momentum? So how in the world does it rotate? It starts out with no angular momentum, and somehow it twists over and lands horizontally. How does that happen? Hmm. Any idea? The way this works is the cat, uh, chain, you, the, the cat, like any creature, in free fall can change its angular position without giving itself net angular momentum. In other words, it basically twists part of its body right and part of it left at different radii. Uh, twists part of body left while another right, or maybe uh, clockwise, uh, part counterclockwise, and then um, and then uh, uses a balance of radius of motion, of radius of motion, to keep everything stable. Uh, of motion. <coughs> to keep from returning to the same um, balance of, uh, sorry, radius of motion, radii of motion, to uh, return to a different uh, position than it started at. To a different position than it started moving at.
In other words, for, for complex objects, while angular momentum will be conserved with no external forces, with no, exter with, with no external torques, sorry, with no external torques, while angular momentum is conserved, position, absolute angular position, is not. There is no such thing as a law of conservation of angular position. There's a conservation of momentum, but not a conservation, sorry, not a conservation of angular position. So um, that's the idea there. So um, if you are, has anyone heard of a reaction wheel before? A reaction wheel. A reaction wheel has nothing to do with cats. It has something to do with spacecraft. So um, I'm back to space. I know. Anyone here played Kerbal Space Program? It's a great game. I recommend it. It's so much fun. It's also why I don't have your exams graded yet. But um, anyway, uh, anyway, um, Kerbal Space Program. Um, it's a it's a fun game. But I highly recommend it. You can also here on YouTube find uh, many um, examples of Kerbal Space Program. It's been around for a few years, maybe five or six years or so, but it's, uh, it's a really fun game. But anyway, it's based off of semi-realistic rocket physics. A lot of the parts are actually uh, modeled off of um, actual um, uh, rocket parts from NASA and things like that. And you basically build little model spaceships, and you, you have these little green alien dudes who are your astronauts, and you send them off into space, and inevitably they die horribly because you have your poor, very poor rocket designs that you put together. So because um, you're building a rocket without actually doing any of the math on it, but you're sort of uh, sort of snapping parts together and seeing what happens. Um, but anyway, and getting progressively, hopefully, better at it. But um, anyway, in the real, even in terms of real rocket design, uh, you use something called a reaction wheel. If you want to change the uh, position, angular position or rotation of a, uh, a of a rocket, so. Um, now, say you have a space station or a rocket or something like that, and maybe there's some solar panels on it. Uh, I don't know, something like this. Crudely drawn space station, maybe a few windows, whatever. Um, say you want to rotate this, or you want to give this thing a spin. If you want to make this thing rotate, how could you do it? Say you need to rotate it for, um, or actually, let's look at something Let's look at kind of a, a maybe a, w there haven't been any spacecraft built with this, but you could actually do this if you wanted to, which is, has anyone here heard of the concept of spin gravity? Spin gravity in, in space stations. Um, we, we have not, uh, up to this point, built any space stations large enough to use this, but you actually could. Uh, say you wanted to, um, one of the main problems with spacecraft uh, or people in spacecraft for long periods of time is that you, um, if they are not under gravity, they start they start suffering various deleterious health effects like mu muscle loss, bone loss, vision problems. Many things associate he the human body is built to operate in a gravitational field. It is designed through millions of years of evolution to work in an in a, in a system of gravity. If the uh, if you remove the gravity from really any organism. Uh, it starts suffering health problems, and long term, without gravity, um, it suffers uh, problems. So, um, now the nice thing about this is, so the, that, that's the downside. The, the, the positive thing, though, is gravity is really just acceleration. It's it's an inertial acceleration, but it's just acceleration. And so, if you produce an acceleration, even if it's an angular acceleration, you can sort of simulate gravity without the mass the size of a planet. So, if you have a system. If you want your this is this might be one setting where, where you would want your space station or spaceship to rotate, in that if you rotate this, the person standing inside the wheel, if you have a spinning wheel, and then the person standing inside this would experience a centrifugal force, uh, or sort of ex uh, forcing them to the outside, um, or it's a centripetal force. That's the force required for them to go along with the circle, but. If you balance this right with the right radius of wheel and the right uh, rate of rotation, you can, act, and you have a large enough space station, you can basically have someone um, basically being under one g of gravity just by spinning a large space station. Now, uh, you do get some interesting Coriolis effects, like you to to get this uh, really a, a system where it doesn't like cause seasickness or where the effect of gravity at their feet is much different than the effect of their head, which would cause like uh, sickness problems. You need a fairly large system. So until you start building things like you know uh, until you start talking about building like space stations, you know hundreds of feet across or something like that, 
it's difficult to do this as a solid wheel, but okay, so say you wanted your space station to rotate for whatever reason, or uh, another simple application is spin stabilization, where sometimes crafts or probes are spun. If you want to, uh, if you're trying to aim a craft um, at, uh, say like a, the Voyager space probes, for example, were spin stabilized. Now, you, if you want to spin a craft, you actually want to give it net angular momentum. Say it has a radar dish here, communication dish, various sensors on probes and things like that. A, a nice space probe looking thing, right? And you wanted to spin this kind of thing. I don't want this to look like a cat, but um, kind of think Voyager space probe type thing. And various antennas and booms and things like that on it. If you act, why would you want to spin this thing? You're, it, does, it doesn't need gravity. But um, a complex object like that, especially one of the power source, is going to give off uh, photons. And it's not going to give them off evenly. It's going to have an, an, unequal, um, an unequal photon distribution, heat distribution. Now, you don't tend to think of the momentum of light, but it actually does generate a certain, it does have a certain momentum. So if you shine a flashlight, uh, the... Uh, there is a very, very minute force produced by that by those photons leaving the flashlight. Now, normally this is inconsequential. However, if you are shooting a probe for a billion miles, and literally a billion miles or more, and even um, if you figure out that tiny, tiny fraction of a newton of force, net force generated by an asymmetry in the photonic energy released or photonic momentum, uh, you might actually end up generating a net thrust on your probe. And that might end up, res and that's very difficult to model and measure. So that might re re result in your probe being, you know, thousands of miles off course by the time you are traveling billions of miles. So one thing you can do is you can just spin the craft. And what that does is even if there is an asymmetry in the heat released by the probe, that means that it all adds up to zero because you're randomly emitting the photons at a regular rate. And so then there is no net change in, in the linear momentum of the system as you're moving. But anyway, those are applications why you might want to spin something in space. So how do you do it? Well, you have a couple ways. If we're trying to give an object floating in the vacuum of space net angular momentum, there's basically two ways. Well, actually, uh, angular momentum, there's two ways. If you actually want to produce real net angular momentum, you could just expel particles. You could have a little jets that throw out jets of hot air or hot uh, plasma or hot gas of some sort, of hot vapor or hot air, just kind of like the you know contents of this course, um, and have them uh, expelled from the um, spacecraft off little nozzles, little, small rocket engines, and you just spin it up that way. The problem with that is that now that requires reaction mass. And once it's gone from your spacecraft, it's gone. It's out in space. You can't get it back. So that is good if you actually want to give net angular momentum. But what if you just want to spin it? What if you don't actually care about net angular momentum? Well, you could have, if you want this thing to spin, actually, do I have this balanced right? So it would go, um, it would go, um, actually, probably the opposite way, I think. Um, if this is ex going this way, this being um, clockwise, the craft would tend to spin counterclockwise. But anyway, one thing you could do is, instead of using the, the uh, expelling particles, you could actually have a small centrifuge, a reaction wheel, a, a, a spinning wheel, basically just a small, um, a small just flywheel basically that spins really 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 fast and you have it on like magnetic bearings or something in a vacuum chamber small vacuum chamber of its own so that it, it will not take much energy to continually spin see the thing about spacecraft is that energy is essentially free if you have solar panels if you have solar panels on your craft which most do um, you can get not as much energy as you want, but you can get lots of energy for free just from the sun and from uh, solar panels. But momentum is not free. That requires expelling reaction mass. But if you, all you care about is rotating the craft or making it spin, you can just have your wheel spin at a certain velocity, angular velocity. And if this spins like this, this will cause the satellite or the craft to spin in the opposite direction. So you can, you can easily rotate your craft just by spinning a wheel in the opposite direction. And so you can do that without losing any reaction mass. See, the problem with throwing mass like this out is once it's gone, it's gone. You have a, you have a tank full of rocket fuel, and once it's gone, it's gone. 
and you can't change your orientation anymore. If you use a reaction wheel, well then you can just change it to whatever you like. And if you have multiple ones pointed in, in different directions, you can have this thing pointed in any direction you want. And so uh, for something like a space telescope, you would absolutely want to use something like this, a set of gyroscopes and reaction wheels to make the, uh, the telescope point in whatever direction is convenient. And that is just another idea of the conservation of linear and angular momentum. So I think I may leave it at there for today. I think that's just a brief introduction to some of these concepts. I think we'll look at some um, example problems and continue on to some other topics on Thursday. So that'll do it for today. As always, thanks for watching. And as always, uh, thank you.